Welcome to Dead Man Talking. Tonight's show is an action-packed and fear-packed story. Um, quite a long one, guys, so I'm going to do this in two parts. As ever, please do let us know down below in the comments what you thought. Please do like and share and help build our channel and our community further. It really does help. This is a first story from the brand new author that I'm working with called Wayne Harbinson. A uh, huge thank you, Wayne, for supporting myself and, uh, and contributing to the show as well. And so, without further ado, let's get into tonight's story, entitled The Hunters Hunted. Let's get straight into that. Hunt number 16. Hunt Masters, redacted. Number of Hunt Judges, 2. Judges, redacted. Date of Hunt, 197-80526-29. Memorial Day Weekend. Number of Specimens, 2. Specimens. Delta, Mother, Golf, Yankee, dash 122. Serial. Delta, Mother, Golf Yankee, 197-202-215 and Golf Golf Whiskey, dash 127, Serial, Golf Golf Whiskey, dash 2A, 1976-1225. Location of Hunt, Pike County, Kentucky. Purpose of Hunt, to compare and contrast the hunting efforts, effectiveness, and techniques of two different species of cryptid known colloquially as Dogman and Gugwe. Hunt Master's Notes Specimens will be introduced on opposite ends of the lake. Being as this is an open wilderness with few inhabitants, both specimens will be constantly monitored to make sure they don't leave the area surrounding a lake or stray into the few settlements located nearby. Only individuals actually in the forest around the lake will be counted as legitimate kills. Local law enforcement and wildlife management have been distracted by a rescue drill two counties north. May 1978 Jim Grant was a good man and he took his responsibilities for his family and his community seriously. Case in point was the little escape he planned for his son and several of his teammates on the junior high football team. He along with Tanner Lee, the father of another player, were riding a herd of half a dozen boys on the cusp of manhood for a week-long camping trip. Well, it was sort of a camping trip. For part of the time, he and Tanner were teaching the boys about the building techniques of a century past as they constructed a primitive cabin on the shores of the lake in southeastern Kentucky. Even though they were well into the summer at home, the air here, especially the night air, was on the chilly side for the families that were raised on the Gulf Coast of Alabama. Travelling nearby 12 hours across four states with half a dozen rowdy boys in the back of a brand new 1978 model RV had been a challenge, but Jim had to admit that he had enjoyed even that part of the trip, especially since Tanner was more than happy to help with the driving, the last two hours of which had been on barely usable mountain roads deep in the forest surrounding the lake. If they'd gotten stuck, they were a couple of days walk back to the nearest phone. It was a good thing he had an old Willis Jeep towed behind the GMC Swinger for situations like that. He looked after his boys. Stepping out of the RV, he looked around at the pop-up tents the boys were sharing. He was surprised to see the youngest boy, Lance McKnight, was coming up the trail from the lake. A fishing rod in hand and what looked like a stringer full of white bass, already gutted and descowled. Smiling as he looked past the boy and could see the mist rising from the lake and from the verdant mountains on the other side of it, he asked, What you got there, Lance? White bass, sir, the boy said politely. Got up just before sunrise and went down to that outcropping we were swimming in off yesterday. Lots of structure in the water there, so I figured with the water quiet, the fish would use it for cover. <laughs> Looks like you were right, Jim said, smiling at the boy. He was one of the newer members of the team, having transferred him from a school in the northern portion of the state. He had a rough year last year, managing to fight off an armed robber in his mum's house, 
and two bear attacks at his dad's place. See, shadows on the road not taken for details. But by the end of the season, he had more than proved his worth to the team. The boy had an arm on him like Namath, it was quick and wily as a fox in a pocket, and out of the pocket he could almost lose any defender. What were you using as bait? White rooster towel, sir, the boy replied. Thought we could have some fish along with Mr. Lee's eggs and biscuits. Hmm, sounds good, Jim told him. There's coffee in the pot if you're interested. Thank you, sir, the boy replied, taking a fish to the RV. Shaking his head, he couldn't get past how polite and put together that kid was for a 14-year-old, especially considering his recent ordeals. Then, turning to the tents, he started yelling, Up and at him, boys! Time to get up and police the campground. Breakfast should be ready by the time you're done. Then, we've got to get to work. Today, you learn how to shape a log with a broad axe. The plan was for the boys to help build the cabin with traditional tools during the morning, and then after lunch, the day was theirs to explore the local woods and lake. In the end, he got help with his and Bobby's camping cabin, and the boys got two weeks of vacation in the woods and learned some useful skills. Grumbling, five teenage boys crawled from their tents, stretched, yawned. Then, rubbing their sleep from their eyes, they each found a tree at the edge of the camp and relieved themselves. It didn't take long for six boys to get the place cleaned up and everything ready for the day. Jim noted that the McKnight boy was carrying a mug of steaming coffee around the campsite as he helped his teammates. Where'd you go this morning? Jeff, Jim's son, asked. Fishing, Lance replied. I like to fish. Bobby smiled and said, Man, you never look or act like an expert. I warned you about trying to put people in boxes. Everybody has things that surprise you. That's what makes life interesting, Lance told him. Jim smiled and remembered what Coach Harris had said about the transfer student. Sometimes he sounds a hell of a lot older than he is. The fish for breakfast was a welcome surprise, and Tanner did a good job of fixing them. After clean-up, they all hiked the quarter mile to the cabin and got to work. The logs had already been cut to length and stacked. Jim showed Paul, Jeff and Lance how to use the broad axe to hew the logs and shape two sides into a flat surface to better fit against the logs above and below. After making sure they knew what and how to do it, he turned to the boys that were learning to use the splitting axe to cut some of the logs lengthwise. Before long, they were all working hard, and Jim was surprised that the Hewin team was keeping up with him and Tanner, who were putting the logs into their places. By the time lunch whistle sounded, six boys and two men, all gleaming with summer sweat, called it quits and knocked off for the day. After a lunch of bologna sandwiches, chips and Coca-Colas, the boys headed back to the outcropping of rocks to swim, while Jim and Tanner went back to the working on the cabin. As they reached the end of the trail to where the cabin was located, Tanner looked over to the hewn logs and said, Can't believe those boys got so much done. They had to have worked their little asses off. Jim nodded and picked up the splitting maul and told him, It's good to see the boys with solid work ethic. Kind of rare these days. Turning back towards the cabin, a flash of movement in the tree line caught his attention, and for a second, Jim thought it might be a deer, but realised that they would be bedded down somewhere right now to avoid the noonday heat. What? Tanner asked. Jim shrugged. Well, I thought I saw something. Light must be playing tricks on me. Too much soft living. Tanner teased him as he walked towards the back of the cabin. Let me find a tree and I'll be right back. Oh, now who's getting soft? Jim asked. Disappearing around the back of the thick log wall, Tanner started to say something. It was cut off mid-word. There was a wet thud against the back wall that shook the building. What was that? What'd you say? Tanner? He called. The silence was slowly replaced with the unnerving sound of flesh being torn and squished along with an audible growl. Hefting the maul in his hands, Jim headed in the direction his friend had disappeared. Suddenly, fear rose up from his gut to reach his very soul. It was like nothing he'd ever experienced before. It was pure malice and hatred directed towards him. This isn't funny. Tan? Round in the corner, Jim nearly lost control of his bladder at the sight that awaited him. Poor Tanner looked as if he'd been torn nearly in half. His crushed head was hanging in at an odd angle from his torso, which had been bent backwards and folded over his lower half, forming a horrible maw of organs, bones and flesh as blood spurted from his still beating heart. He was being held by some dark creature, 
straight from the bowels of hell. And it crouched over, burying its face into the cavern formed by Tanner's ribcage. Its long, bloody teeth tore out organs in long streams of flesh before it slurped them down like bloody oysters. The blood-covered face of the creature was clearly canine in form, not unlike some kind of giant wolf, complete with pointed ears. Amber eyes glowed with malice as it pulled back and saw Jim standing there. Dropping Tanner's body into the blood that had pulled at its feet, the creature stood up to its full height and its head cleared the wall of the cabin. It had a massive black fur covered chest and thick neck and its shoulders. They were like bowling balls and its arms seemed too long for its body and it ended in clawed hands. Yes, hands, not paws and the claws on those hands were a good two inches long. Its torso was very human-like in shape and formed a neat triangle that dipped into its hips like that of a bodybuilder. Arnold Schwarzer something, the one who played Hercules in that bad movie Jim and Jeff had watched the other night. The legs folded forward and then bent back, as if the knees were turned backwards, and it stood on long clawed toes. For a second, Jim stood there, his mind refusing to process what his senses were telling him. The squishing sound of Tanner's body broke Jim from his paralysis. Some part of Jim's brain that was more infra than ultra kicked into play as his body ruled out flight and chose instead to fight. If this thing would do this to Tanner, Jim shuddered to think what it could do to the boys. Screaming incoherently, Jim stepped into the monster, swinging the splitting maul at its head with everything he had in him. Momentarily surprised, the great beast stepped back and twisted its body as the maul missed its head and instead impacted on its side, about foot under its left arm. There was an audible sound of bone being split by the blade of the maul as it sunk into its haft. Howling once into the late afternoon air, the creature's arm dropped to cover the handle so that Jim couldn't get it free to use again. And its other arm lashed out at Jim's face, claws first. Ducking low to avoid the strike to his face, he found to see the clawed hand sweeping down and back, catching him in the shoulder and pulling him close to its body. Jim could feel his face suddenly impact the blood-soaked fur over hard muscle as the claws bit deep into his back and pulled him upward. It stank to high heaven, worse than even a skunk. Twisting in the grip of the creature's good arm, Jim grabbed at the handle with the maul and pulled it free as he felt those horribly massive teeth sink into his side. Fire and pain shot through his body as the dog-like face tore out huge chunks of Jim's flesh and organs. He felt a hard tug that pulled his kidney and part of his bladder from his body. And with the last vestiges of his strength, he let the head of the maul drop and then pulled it back to pendulum. It forward again into the juncture between the creature's legs. He felt the blade sink in deep just before the creature howled again in pain. Suddenly the world went sideways as he slammed into the wall. There was an explosion of light in his skull and the last thing that went through Jim Grant's mind was, who will look after the boys? After Action Judge's report, Judge redacted. Notes. Specimen's first kill, four points. Specimen's second kill, 25% for being injured by the use of a splitting maul. Specimen's injuries are concerning as they could be life-threatening. Judge recommends having specimen recall to receive veterinary attention. Judge overruled under protest by Huntmaster. The scream that echoed off the mountains and lake were all too familiar to Lance McKnight. It was the sound he'd remember all of his life, the inhuman cry of the Gwinner. He didn't understand how it could be the same creature whose head he'd sliced off with his transformed arm last autumn. Surely it hadn't come to life again, but maybe it did. Mr Dubois mentioned that his ancestor, Captain Sheridan McNaughton, had raised it from the grave and set it to guard his plantation, Bon Travel, until a worthy heir returned. As the rest of his friends looked around to see from where the whale had come from, Lance had already pinpointed it as coming from the direction of the cabin they'd been helping to build earlier. Looking around to make sure none of the other boys were watching him, he jumped down from the rock they'd been climbing onto to leap off into the lake and hit the ground running towards the cabin. When he was out of sight of the rock, he poured on the speed until he burst from the trowel into the clearing where the cabin sat. 
Something dark flashed into the woods to his left, and he turned to track the giant Gwynna as it disappeared into the forest. Making his way carefully around the corner of the cabin, he saw the mutilated bodies of the two men that were supposed to be in charge of this camping trip. He shuddered. The fun vacation he was hoping for had just turned into a mission, whether he liked it or not. And he had no way of contacting anyone at the Office of Arcane Investigations to get help. He turned around and started to head back to where the other boys were. When they came crashing down the trail he'd left, McKnight! What the hell? You took off like a bat out of hell, Bobby Lee said. Looking around, it was clear that the other boy was looking for his dad, or Mr. Grant. Where's dad? He asked. Lance shook his head, and then looked from Bobby over to Jeff. There's no good way to tell you this, and you're going to insist anyway, he said with a sigh. What are you talking about, McKnight? This more of that hippie philosophy crap? Jeff demanded. Lance breathed in deeply and looked to Peter, Paul and Tommy. You three don't have to see this. As a matter of fact, I'd warn you not to. But I know you're going to want to. So be it. He motioned to the back of the cabin with his head. Go ahead. Take a look. Just don't touch anything. That's what I found when I got here. Again, he looked at Peter, Paul and Tommy and said softly, You may want to keep close to Jeff and Bobby. What are you babbling about? Bobby asked, stalking to the back of the cabin. Jeff hot on his heels. The next instant was broken by twin wows of, Dad! The other three followed quickly to see what had happened. There was the sound of a scuffle as the other three boys dragged their friends from the grisly sight of their father's bodies. Lance hated that they had to see it, wished there was some way to protect them from seeing it, but knew that, without visual confirmation, they'd never accept that they were in danger. After Jeff and Tommy unchucked their cokes and bologna sandwiches, while Lance kept watch, Jeff glared at him. What happened? I don't know, Lance half lied. This was what I found when I got here just a minute or two before you guys. You didn't see nothing? Jeff demanded. Lance shook his blonde head and told him, Nothing. But we need to get out of here. Go back down to the road and find a phone and uh, call the police. How? Jeff demanded. The jeep, Bobby said. Can anybody drive a jeep? Lance said quietly, I can drive a tractor. It's not that different. Gears are the same place, clutch works the same way. The other boys looked at each other and then at Lance. A mixture of fear, grief and queasiness spread across their faces. Lance realised that they were just moments from a complete breakdown and he didn't know if he had it in him to bring them back together afterward. Okay, let's head back. We can take the jeep to that little store. About ten miles back, we saw when we turned off onto the trail. He watched helplessly as the other boys looked over to the corner of the cabin. We can't leave them like that, Jeff protested. I know, Lance said, picking up a log under each arm and carrying them around the back. What are you doing? Bobby demanded. Covering them so animals can't get to them. Lance said as he built a lean-to against the side of the cabin with the logs, making a shelter for the bodies. It took about ten trips before it was built to his satisfaction. He didn't dare ask for the other boy's help. It would have to live with the images. But they shouldn't. For the first time since his 56-year-old self woke up in a 13-year-old body last year, the older version of Lance's mind was glad for the maturity as he was going to need it to keep them all alive. He was almost glad for it as he was for the witcheries this particular version of his 13 year old self had. Protecting his family from the Gwynna that had attacked his home had been one thing. It had focused on him and to a lesser extent to his little brother Dale. This one had killed the only two legal adults on the trip. The stakes in this encounter had just gone through the roof. Coming from behind the cabin, dusting his hands against each other, he looked at the other five. Okay, we're on a buddy system. Find someone to stick close to and don't lose them. Tried to keep everyone in sight as we walked back to camp. He told them as he picked up the broad axe he'd been using earlier to shape the logs. What are you going to do with that? Paul asked. Hopefully, nothing. But if whatever did this comes back, I want something in my hand to use as a weapon. Good idea, Peter said, picking up a pry bar from the worksite. With a general nod from the others, they all picked up something they felt would make a good weapon. Jeff asked, Where's the splitting mall? 
Lance thumbed towards the back of the cabin. Back there. It looks like your dad tried to use it on whatever attacked him. It's probably best to leave it there. Something about what Lance said seemed to comfort the other boys. Taking a deep breath, Lance told them. Jeff, your buddy is Paul. Tommy, yours is Peter. Bobby, you're with me. Try to stay together and not lose sight of each other. Whatever this thing is, it may try to separate us to make us easier to take. You're scurry when you start talking like that, Bobby told him as he took his place besides Lance. Just trying to keep us all safe, Lance replied as he pointed down the trail with a broad axe. Camps that way. Lance couldn't help but notice that the forest around the lake had suddenly become unnaturally quiet. It took him back to the first encounter and confrontation with the Gwinner in the forest near the Perdido River. He had a very bad feeling about this. Vasir, I could really use your help right now. He sent a silent plea out to his mentor as they picked their way down the trail, alert for anything. A loud crash followed the sounds of screeching metal suddenly filled the air around them. Lance watched as the other boys froze on the trail. That was not a good sign, as it was among the worst things they could do if the creature were to suddenly appear. In a low voice, he told the others, If that thing suddenly shows up, I want you to scatter with your body. Just head in opposite directions. We'll meet up at camp as soon as we can. Bobby, I want you to go with Jeff and Paul. Why? The other boy asked. What are you going to do? I'm going to try and chop its legs out from under him. Then hightail it after you. That's insane, Lance, Paul protested. It'll kill you. Trust me, I know the danger, but I think I can cut it off at the knees and get out of its way. A couple of good chops and it's not going to want to chase anybody. We stick together, Paul protested. Lance shook his head and projected his will into the command. Just do it, I'll catch up. He watched as the boys were stunned by the force of his will. Paul was the first to come out of it. Okay, but I think you're crazy. He, along with the other four, nodded their heads. Lance was glad for the practice sessions on using his enhancements, or witcheries as Boone Dubois, his teacher called them. After several long moments of sounds, of screeching metal, crashing wood and shattering glass and ripping cloth, the forest, once again, became quiet. I have a very bad feeling about this, Peter warned. I do too, Pete. I do too, Lance told him. What now? Paul whispered. Now, we quietly pick our way back to camp, Lance said. Here, let me and Bobby in front. Jeff and Paul, you get behind us. Tommy and Peter, I want you two to keep to the rear and watch our backs. Slipping forward, Lance began advancing slowly and as silently as he could. Going on soft, silent feet took nearly half an hour to get back to camp. Luckily, they found it empty of the creature, but the place was a wreck. The side door had been ripped off the RV and had been turned over on its side. With a groan of disappointment, Lance noted that the drive shaft had been ripped from the rear axle. The Jeep, on the other hand, it was upside down, and the wheels had been pulled off of the hubs of the driver's side, and the gas tank it had been punctured. The three tents had been ripped to shreds and their gear were scattered all around the area and a sharp, musky scent. It was everywhere. It was then that Lance noticed the puddles of yellow liquid at various points in the camp, including the open cooler. Damn thing marked everything in camp. What? Peter asked. It's pissed all over our stuff, Paul told him, picking up a punctured can of coke and making a disgusted face. Jeff... You and Paul put out the campfire, Lance told him. Peter and Tommy, see if you can find any food that hasn't been marked. Bobby, you and I are going to look for something to protect ourselves with, other than just a broad axe and a handful of tools. Dad kept a gun locked in the glove compartment, Jeff said. He said it was for bears. Bears? Lance asked. You never know, Jeff replied with a shrug. I wish he had it with him when they were attacked. Lance said, climbing up on top of the cab of the RV. Bobby, keep a close lookout for me. The other boy nodded and said, You got it. There was a tone of anger to his voice. Lance didn't know if it was a good or bad. He didn't want the boy to do something stupid out of anger or grief and get himself killed. The driver's door had been ripped off its hinges and flung aside by the creature. And so, 
It wasn't difficult to wriggle his way past large consoles in the middle of the cab and find the glove box. Noting that it was locked, Larch looked around to make sure that others couldn't see him before casually ripping it open and finding a 44 auto mag pistol, three magazines and a box of rounds. Jeff's dad had expensive tastes in handguns, but it could definitely bring down a bear. Lance didn't know about a Gwinner, but he hoped so. Glancing back into the main cabin of the RV, he noted the deep gashes on the walls, the ripped and torn cushions, and the holes punctured clean through the sides. Mr. Grant must have really put a hurt on it for the thing to take out this anger on the RV like this. Found it, he called out. What'd you find? Peter asked from outside. He ejected the magazine and then the round in the chamber and stuck it down in his waistband as he put the extra magazines and the rounds in his pockets before wiggling his way up and out of the cab. Sticking his head out, he looked around to see Bobby and the others watching him. Looking over at Jeff, he said, Your dad has good taste in handguns. What is it? Peter asked. A 44 auto mag pistol, he told them. Anybody other than me know how to fire it? He watched the other boys shake their heads, giving him a surprisingly honest answer. No, Jeff said. Dad was supposed to teach me on this trip. His voice dripped of grief. Do you mind if I keep it until we get out of this mess? Lance asked gently. No, if you know how to use it then, it's best it stays with you. Looking around, he asked. Okay, let's take stock of what we've got to work with. Each team had found several items that might be of use. Among them was Lance's fishing gear. He smiled at the end and said, If we're heading away from this lake, the fishing gear won't be of much help. But it was a good thought. Definitely like your survival instincts, he told Tommy and Peter. Now what else? Food-wise, we found two loaves of bread and some bologna that hadn't been marked. Also a six-pack of Cokes and some canteens, Paul said. Good. If we're only out a day or so to get to that phone, that should keep us going. Lance told him. And see if you can find some long sleeve shirts or, or jackets. It's getting colder at night here. He had a sneaking suspicion that they weren't going to get too far before the creature came looking for them. If it was smart enough to destroy their food and their escape route, it was smart enough to set up an ambush. The question in Lance's mind was from where it was going to come from. It was much easier for him when he wasn't trying to keep five other boys safe while he fought it off. If it was just him, he had several avenues of escape, but there was no way he was going to go off and leave them unguarded. The best he could hope for is that Boone, or Vasir, heard his mental call for help. Judge's Target Report Judge Redacted Notes Specimen has stranded a group of six boys who were camping with victims one and two near the lake. One boy seems to be in charge and is acting out of character for his age group. So far, he has managed to keep the boys from breaking down or apart and has them focused on getting to safety. They've recovered short-term rations and several means of defence, including one handgun capable of damaging the experimental specimens. Recommend further investigation of one Lance McKnight by research staff. Whose bright idea was it to bring three 15-year-old girls and a 10-year-old boy camping? Geraldine Howard asked herself as she gingerly picked her way along the trail leading from a lake to the campsite near her nitwit husband had picked out. Oh yeah, that's right. It was her nitwit husband, Jack. He made good money as an engineer at Armco and Russell, Kentucky, and they could afford a vacation in Hawaii. They did last year, but this year... It was his choice and he wanted to come out to a mosquito-infested lake in the deepest, darkest, most backward section of Kentucky he could find and go camping. Well, at least the triplets seemed to be enjoying it. She didn't understand why, but Deborah, Denise and Donna took to camping and the outdoors like their father. It wasn't that they were tomboys, far from it. They all three were in the running for freshman homecoming queen last year. But they adored their father and took up whatever activity he suggested with gusto. They played basketball. They were, after all, Kentuckians. Tennis and ran track and field. And it kept them fit. And Geraldine had to admit that it probably kept them out of trouble. They weren't yet allowed to date. That would come next year when all three of them turned 16. So maybe 
It would keep their minds off boys. Hell, even Todd, the youngest, was enjoying himself. But he had run wild through the woods at home before, barefoot and carefree since he was old enough to walk. He learned to swim almost immediately, and after that it was nearly impossible to keep him away from water. And keeping him away from the Ohio was paramount, as the river appeared to be deceptively calm all the while it was unforgiven. People didn't casually swim there. Spying her husband loading the grill with charcoal, she growled at him. Next year, we do the Bahamas. Not enjoying yourself? Her husband asked with a smile. Swatting a mosquito, she said, no. I'm not. I don't like sleeping on the ground, cleaning up after the kids and sweating all day long. She growled with a swatted another mosquito and added, And these damn mosquitoes seem to have it out for me. Jack chuckled and said, Next year, you get to pick the vacation. Looking around, he asked, Where are the kids? She nodded towards the trowel she'd just come up from and said, The girls are trying to ignore Todd, who's making a magnificent pest of himself to them. And that's what little brothers are supposed to do, Jack told her. They keep their sisters honest. What's to be honest about? Geraldine asked. You know, all the little beauty tricks that girls use to make themselves more attractive. By pointing those out, it keeps them from making too much from their looks. And of course, they make life miserable for him in return. That keeps us all happy. Except for me, she growled. Jack smiled and came around from behind the grill and asked... Well, what can I do to make you better? He moved behind her and started rubbing her shoulders. Oh, that's a good start, she told him, as he needed the tension from her neck and back, running a stiff finger along either side of her spine. I'll give you exactly ten hours to stop that. He laughed and said, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to end it sooner. Here soon. Four hungry stomachs are going to come up that trowel, wanting to eat. She chuckled as her irritability began to subside. In just a few more minutes, she pleaded. Shoulders. She closed her eyes and let go of her irritability and began to drift off. Suddenly, Jack's hand stopped rubbing and squeezed her shoulder hard. In a level voice that dripped fear, her husband said, Geraldine, whatever you do, don't open your eyes until I tell you to. When I tell you, open them and run like hell for the kids. Do you understand me? What are you talking about? She demanded. For once in your life, don't argue with me about it. Just do it. His voice was harsh and hit her like a truck. Her husband was generally frightened and that scared her. Okay, she told him. Good, he said as he let go of her shoulder with one hand. She could feel him leaning back for something and search without looking. Okay, when I say... Now, take off straight to your left, not towards the trail. He must have found what he was looking for, because he stood up about the time a low and dangerous sounding growl came from directly ahead of them. Now, he shouted and nearly dumped her out of the chair in the direction he wanted her to go. Opening her eyes, she took off running. She hadn't gotten a dozen feet when she looked over towards the trail and saw the monstrosity standing there. It was close to ten feet tall and covered in dark red fur. It had conical shaped head and what looked like a bear snout that was full of far more sharp teeth than should be there. Its eyes almost glowed red in the afternoon shadows. Its body was massive, reminding her of that six million dollar man episode with Bigfoot. But this, this was no gentle giant. This thing was clearly made for murder and mayhem. Run Geraldine, run! Get the kids out of here! Dear sweet Jack yelled at her as he threw himself between the monster and her. His only weapon, a hatchet, used to drive stakes into the ground for the tents. With a guttural growl, it suddenly mimicked Jack's voice. Run, Geraldine! Get the kids! Jack screamed and leapt at the towering monster as he swung the hatchet at its head. Geraldine turned and ran. She couldn't go to the kids. This thing would get to them too. She had led it away to keep it from discovering them down at the lake. Ignoring the small pains as the forest floor tore at her bare feet, she raced through the woods towards the road, hoping to find help, hoping against hope that she could lead the thing away from her kids. She nearly made it. She was halfway up the embankment leading to the old gravel road that had come down when a vice clamped down on her ankle. Turning, she looked back into the blood-smeared face of the creature. Before it lifted her high above its head, 
She noted a gash in the side of its forehead and some small part of her mind hoped that Jack had at least gotten one good blow in. Suddenly, the world flashed by her, her body spasmed in pain as her back was snapped across the knee of whatever this thing was. Then it pulled her up and it opened its maw impossibly wide as it crunched down on her face. The last thought of Geraldine and Howard was that she didn't know the name of the beast that had killed her. After Action Judge's report, Judge redacted. Notes. Specimen's first kill, full points. Specimen's second kill, full points. Specimen was not seriously injured by first victim's hatchet. Todd Howard heard his father's screams echo off the mountain and lake. Something's wrong with Dad, he told his older sisters. He's just messing with us, Deborah replied, looking at the sun setting behind the mountains. Oh, but he's waiting behind the tent or something to scare us. Just go back to swimming. I'll let you know when it's time to go up for dinner. Todd nodded and returned to diving for mussel shells in the lake and soon forgot about the screams he'd heard. It wasn't until the sun was disappearing behind the western mountains in a wild display of purples and oranges that he looked around. Hey dweebs. What? Denise looked up from the book she was reading in the dying light. Is there something missing? He stood in the water, his hands on his hips. What? Deborah asked. Donna looked up the trowel and said, The fire. It's past six o'clock and Dad always has a fire started by now. She uncurled her long legs from under her and stood up, wrapping the towel upon which she had been sitting on. Come on, pest, she said. Let's go see what's cooking. Turning to the others, she said, Why don't you two gather our stuff? Bossy, isn't she? Deborah complained. Yeah, Denise answered. But she's right. Something's wrong. Come on. She said as she waded from the water and slid her feet into the flip-flops she'd left on the bank. The four of them slowly picked their way through the lengthening shadows that fell across the privet lining the edge of the path. Todd was getting worried. He couldn't hear anything coming from camp. The only sounds he could hear was a low buzz coming from up ahead. As they cleared the trail into the campsite, Donna gasped next to him and then quickly tried to cover his eyes. He had already seen the grisly corpse of his father. His face was a mess of black flies buzzing around as brains and blood oozed from his ear. His body looked bent and broken and a small hatchet lay beside his right hand. The rest of the camp had been ransacked. The tents, they were in shreds and the food was scattered everywhere. Todd looked around as panic began to build somewhere in his stomach. Where's mum? He finally asked. Denise and Deborah arrived right behind them. Deborah began to scream and Denise started sobbing. Only Donna seemed to be in control of herself. Todd knew that he was just a few seconds from sobbing too. He reached up and took Donna's hand in his. She squeezed it tightly and looked down at him as he fought back the tears. Emotions he didn't understand started welling up inside of him and he savagely crushed them. Mum was missing. And there was time to break down and cry for Dad later. They had to find Mum. He wouldn't let himself contemplate the idea that she was 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 like dad we have to find mum he said fighting back tears donna looked down at him and said i'll go look for her you stay here with these two todd squeezed her hand tighter no we don't separate we stay together until we find mum she'll know what to do he watched as she looked over his head to the sisters i don't know how good an idea it is to go traipsing through the woods in the dark and i need someone to be here to keep deb and then from doing something stupid. He shook his head emphatically. No, we don't split up. We stay together, no matter what. He squeezed her hand harder, refusing to let go. Look, there's the camp lantern over there. We'll light it and all four of us go. Again, she looked down at him. Something she saw in his face convinced her. Okay, we all go. Turning to Deborah, she said, Get the lantern, Denise. Look around and see if there's something here we can use to protect ourselves. You mean like a gun? Denise asked. I mean anything. I don't think Dad brought a gun with us, she said, looking around. What do you think we have to fight off? Todd asked. 
Shrugging, she said, Whatever can do that to Dad? There was a short hitch in her words, as it was clear that she was trying hard, as she could, to keep it together. Then, with her free hand, she pointed to a huge footprint in the ground. And whatever can leave a footprint like that? Todd shook his head. The first thought that came to his mind was that of Bigfoot. But weren't they supposed to be gentle? Except for the one that Steve Austin fought, that is. But in the end, even that one turned out to be a good guy. The thought of an evil Bigfoot did almost as much to shake the boy's worldview as the sight of his father's mutilated body. Finally, he let go of Donna's hand and walked over to the ripped and torn tent. He then gently lay it over his father's twisted and torn form. Looking up at Donna, he stilled his voice and said, Let's go. Even in the fading light, it didn't take much for them to find the path that had been torn through, the undergrowth by a rapid passage. Todd was worried that they were following the trail of the Bigfoot and not their mother. He could not allow himself to think that they were following both. And finally, the trail ended next to the old gravel road that brought them down to their campsite. At the base of the rise upon which the road was sitting, they found what was left of their mother. His sister suddenly closed ranks around him, trying to block the body's sight from in front of him. That's not mum, Todd screamed. That's not her. He refused to acknowledge the reality of the situation. Yes, it is, Donna said with tears in her own eyes. Yes, it is. No, he screamed as the emotions became more than he could handle. He spun around to run away from the awful scene, from the awful conclusion. His dad and his mum were now gone. They'd been killed by some kind of Bigfoot. He couldn't take it anymore as he lit out past Donna. Deborah grabbed him by the arm and spun him around again. He collapsed to his knees sobbing, not knowing what to do with the feelings that were welling up inside of him. What do we do now? Denise asked between sobs. Next to him, Deb shook her head and said, We follow the road back to the station wagon and get out of here. How? Denise asked. First off, we don't have the keys. Secondly, our driving is not the best in the world. And third, I have no idea how to get out of here. We're so far back in the mountains that Mum says Lightning has to get into second gear just to get here. Take one step at a time, Donna told them. First we get back to the car, then two of us go to get keys from Dad's pocket while the others stay with Todd. Then we'll try to backtrack out of here. Sounds like a plan, Deborah agreed. We stay together, Todd sniffed from the ground. We don't separate. Okay, we stay together, Donna agreed. We need to mark this place so we can find it again, Denise suggested as they climbed up the embankment. Let me, Todd said as he scrambled to the top and wiped the tears from his eyes. Turn around, he told his sisters. Why? Just do it, Todd told them. What are you going to do? Donna asked as the three girls turned around, pointing the backs of their long blonde hair towards him. Just stay turned around until I tell you it's okay, he said as he shucked off his cut off shorts and underwear. Quickly pulling his cutoffs back on, he walked over to the side of the road and tied his white briefs to one of the bushes. There. Turning back around, his sisters looked at him and then his solution to the problem. Deborah shook her head and said, Brilliant, Todd. He shrugged and said, It was the only thing I could think of that would stand out. Donna nodded and said, Let's go. Which way? Todd asked. This way. She said, nodding her head to the left. Only Todd caught the quiet, I hope, she said under her breath. Judge's target report. Judge redacted. Notes. It is my recommendation that the four surviving children be removed from the area. The specimen will attack them and they stand no chance of surviving. The value of their kills would be negligible. However, the hunt master has chosen to override my suggestion and so, they stay. Wow. Awesome. Awesome. Thrilling stuff, Wayne. Thank you so, so much for bearing with me. Um, I realised there was another a series that you actually sent over to me about three months ago. Um, just haven't got into it, brother. It's such a long story and uh, I want to do it justice. Do it when I'm in the right frame of mind and feeling good like I am today. Charged, full of life. Guys and girls, as ever... 
please do let us know down below in the comments what you thought please do like and share help build this channel and our community further and help us smash our way through the 30,000 subscriber mark believe me this series is just getting started absolutely action-packed story this one so you do want to stick around for the next installment believe me as ever guys above all remember be safe not sorry <laughs>